160 people have been killed and hundreds more have been injured in Sri Lanka. When the bomb blasts happened, the government shut off access to social media. Sri Lanka's government issued a temporary shutdown of social media networks and messaging apps. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. Here are some of the media stories that we're covering this week. Sri Lanka, after the attacks. The authorities pull the plug on social media, but Sri Lankans almost immediately find a way around the blockages. France's yellow vests and the hostility they have for the news media, the way their story is being reported. A film star and a prime minister have a chat in front of the cameras. What would you call that? Because apparently it wasn't political. And thank you for joining us, Noam. A British rapper manufactures some online dissent with the help of an animated Noam Chomsky. It was carnage, the worst violence in Sri Lanka since the end of the Civil War 10 years ago. Multiple church and hotel bombings on Easter Sunday that killed more than 200 people. In the immediate aftermath, the government shut off access to social media, Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, and Viber. The rationale to stem the spread of hate speech and misinformation. However, there's a complex debate to be had here on the benefits of a social media shutdown versus the costs. Millions of people could not contact their friends and family because in Sri Lanka, social media platforms are the internet itself, such as the online reliance on sites like Facebook and WhatsApp. Moreover, the evidence suggests that shutting off social media does little to check the spread of misinformation. Circumvention is all too easy, and the blocks cut off authentic sources of information as well. And in a country where politicians and the mainstream media have been known to deal in misinformation themselves, an internet shutdown makes it harder to get to the truth. Our starting point this week is the Sri Lankan capital, Colombo. So the first explosions occurred around 8.45 on Easter Sunday morning. Within minutes, the first images started flowing through social media networks. Some of the first photos came clearly from members of the congregation. They were horrific and graphic. We started getting, you know, dozens of WhatsApp messages through various groups trying to figure out what had happened. Lots of speculation and rumors that didn't end up being true. And then around midday, one by one, WhatsApp stopped functioning. Facebook was not loading, Instagram was not, and also YouTube and Snapchat. So social media platforms were not working anymore. Within six hours of the coordinated explosions across Sri Lanka, Allegedly by a group that had pledged allegiance to ISIS, the social media shutdown came into effect. The online information vacuum was in place. There was no official warning, and the justification was slow in coming. Still, the measures came as no surprise to outsiders, social media observers and commentators around the world. With misinformation and hate speech spreading across online platforms, the block seemed to make sense, just not to those actually affected. Sri Lankans. When I see this on Western media, what I see is someone going, oh yeah, Sri Lanka just blocked Facebook because of hate speech. Facebook needs to get its act together. In reality, these are not democratic uh, decisions. What happens is the Sri Lankan government just pulls off a block. It's someone's knee-jerk reaction and, you know, people just have this void of information. You have to sort of weigh the risks that come with social media and how it can be used um, to sort of incite violence and further violence which Sri Lanka has seen in the past. Uh, however, in Sri Lanka, you know, most folks actually communicate through apps like WhatsApp and Viber. And when you block those apps, it makes it very hard to access information about what's going on. And the fact that the news was being broken in, in, oh, through social media rather than through official media channels first, um, and you know, without any government statements right away, um, I think caused people to really sort of panic. Beyond the question of whether a social media blockage is in the societal interest is the question of how effective blockages are, particularly in a tech-savvy country like Sri Lanka 
where the use of VPNs, virtual private networks, has grown widespread. Just over a year ago, in March of 2018, the government attempted its first social media block after anti-Muslim violence erupted in central and eastern Sri Lanka. More than a million social media users reportedly downloaded VPNs, which circumvent blockages by masking a user's location, allowing them to go online from what appears to be another country. So when this blockage occurred, many Sri Lankans were ready. Everybody has VPNs in the country. Most everybody that I know has a VPN installed on their smartphone or devices and computers. And so the first thing that people talk about when they get a hint that the government is trying to block social media is what VPNs you should download and that you should, you should do it immediately. So I'm not sure about the effectiveness of a block in a context where VPNs are so broadly debated and discussed. But the day after the attacks, TunnelBear, one of the most popular VPNs in Sri Lanka, was no longer accessible. Sri Lankans who circumvent the social media blockage do not deny that online discourse can be problematic or even dangerous. The fabrications, misinformation, and the hate speech are there for all to see. However, ethnic and religious divides have always existed in the country. Social media just gives them a prominence across multiple platforms they've never had before. We started seeing fabrications of pretty much everything. The water hoax uh, in particular, uh, where people started receiving messages that water in Hunupitiya was poisoned. And we found that within an hour, there were vehicles going up and down on the roads of, of these areas telling citizens not to drink their water, that this had actually been poisoned. There were fake bombings reported. So you can imagine the kind of uh, shock that must have done to people. Social media, while a tool that was used and has been used to incite hatred and violence in Sri Lanka, is by no means the cause of such hatred and violence. If you look at the history of Sri Lanka since independence, we've had cycles of violence and cycles of riots even. And while I can see the fact that apps like Facebook and um, even WhatsApp and Viber have been used by you know far-right extremist groups to kind of um, propagate a certain narrative around the Muslim community, they by no means are the sort of cause of violence. And I think blocking of those apps is not going to result in an end to violence against the Muslim community. Sri Lankans would be less dependent on social media if they had more faith in their mainstream news outlets, but they do not. Call it the Rajapaksa effect. Mahinda Rajapaksa. Mahinda Rajapaksa was the country's president from 2005 to 2015. Under his watch, journalists faced heavy government pressure and some paid for their work with their lives. In 2009, Reporters Without Borders directly blamed the president and state-owned media for inciting hatred and violence against journalists. Rajapaksa was voted out of office in 2015, providing news outlets with some breathing space. However, late last year, his successor tried to bring him back as prime minister. That led to a legal standoff lasting 51 days over what came to be known as Sri Lanka's soft coup. Most mainstream news outlets supported the return of Rajapaksa. Sri Lanka itihasa ay no makena satahan tabu janadi pati varek khati ata prathasu desha palak nye khati ata ohu pivisi ne thawat Sri Lanka ve alut pitua perlan nata ve heki. Eventually, the courts overturned Rajapaksa's appointment, ruling that it was unconstitutional. That made us realize that our media is no longer serving the public interest. It is serving vested interest. Our newspapers, our radio and television, with a few honorable exceptions, are all captured. There is much that is not right with social media, but the web and social media is also the last space left for us to verify and us to find out and us to express. Social media also played an important role, again, um, in trying to be very critical of how the coup was being conducted, in exposing the kind of bribery attempts that were being made um, by the sort of newly formed um, coup government. Social media was really important in all of that. I shudder to think what could have happened if there was no social media or it was blocked during the 51 days of that crisis. The coup could have have succeeded 
and that's the problem media is compromised media is captured and they have abdicated their public interest remit this is sad but realistic assessment of our traditional or mainstream media sri lanka's social media blockage was supposed to have ended by now but on friday president mathri pala sirasena said there is still too much misinformation out there and if the platforms fail to control it they may be banned permanently under the declared state of emergency the government also has the power to censor mainstream news outlets far from seeing the end of misinformation sri lankans have been left with a lack of information We're discussing other media stories that are on our radar this week with one of our producers, Meenakshi Ravi. Meena, India is now halfway through its general election process, which lasts for a month. And there's this strange story about a non-political interaction with the country's leading politician, Prime Minister Narendra Modi. So what was that about? This was clearly an attempt by Narendra Modi to get a boost from Bollywood through an interview conducted by the film star Akshay Kumar. So, I don't have any political questions. Nila. It was broadcast online by Asian News International, or ANI. It's a private news agency that benefits from close access to Narendra Modi and his party, the BJP. Of course, many mainstream channels then picked up the interview and ran it in its entirety. I want to know our Pradhan Mantri Ji. I want to know that I'm angry. I want to retire everyone. The tone was beyond informal. It was fawning. And this interview has been positioned quite carefully to avoid falling afoul of election commission rules. Now, conventional broadcast interviews are banned while voting is underway. And so this interview was labeled a non-political interaction. So this is Modi and the BJP spotting a loophole in the election rules and just taking advantage of it? Absolutely. They're using the Bollywood card to do that. You see, there are many mainstream outlets that are openly aligned with the BJP, but the Prime Minister is not taking any chances. Bollywood actors have posed for selfies with him. They've tweeted in support of him. In fact, there was even a film, a biopic, that was slated for release just as voting began, but the Election Commission then intervened and said it would have to wait until after results are announced. Okay, going back to social media now for a minute. The meeting this week between the CEO of Twitter and one of the platform's best-known users, Donald Trump, what were they talking about? Well, reportedly, one of their discussions was about something that Trump had tweeted just hours before the meeting took place. He'd said Twitter was constantly taking people off list. That's his way of saying that they were fiddling with his follower numbers. Now, Dorsey explained that as part of Twitter's efforts to clean up the site, a lot of fake accounts and bots have been killed. And so follower numbers are being affected for people across Twitter. But this plays into Donald Trump's suspicion, which exists amongst other conservatives, that somehow these big tech companies are out to get the American right. Correct? Yeah. This is an ongoing conversation happening on the American right, that Twitter, Google, Facebook, they're all out to suppress their presence. Now, I have to say, given the number of opaque and changing algorithms, there is a case to be made for more clarity in how online platforms function. Where Twitter really gets into trouble, however, is when it fails to take action in cases where their rules are clearly being violated. Take Trump, for example. He regularly treats, uh, tweets sexist, racist, and insightful messages. Jack Dorsey, however, has clarified that Twitter does hold public and prominent uh, leaders in, uh, to a different standard. Earlier this year, he said, we believe it's important that the world sees how global leaders think and how they act. There is a new policy, however, in the works for Twitter where they will label offensive tweets and explain why they remain up on the site. Now, that will be interesting to see. Okay. Thanks, Mina. Turning to France now, where President Emmanuel Macron has just announced a tax cut of 5 billion euros. It was one of several new reforms and a victory of sorts for les gilets jaunes the yellow vest protesters who first hit the streets almost six months ago, demonstrating over the price of fuel, the cost of living, and tax fairness. Macron initially tried to appease the movement by boosting the minimum wage, but it didn't work. And when that fire consumed part of Paris's Notre Dame Cathedral and Macron led the fundraising efforts for the reconstruction, he played right into the protesters' hands. Those multi-million dollar donations from billionaires which happen to be tax-deductible, underlined the issues of tax inequality 
and the government's priorities. The media are more than just a subplot in this. Protesters complain about the underreporting of police violence, the sensationalizing of the demonstrations. And reporters have been restricted, manhandled by police and subjected to arrest. So the Yellow Vests are producing their own coverage, live streaming across social networks. The Listening Post's Marcelo Pizarro now on the tussle between the media, the state, and les gilets jaunes. Après plus de cinq mois de mobilisation, nouveau samedi de violence à Paris. C'est un mouvement euh, social et politique inédit, les Gilets jaunes, et historique. Parce qu'on n'est pas comme dans un mouvement classique où il y a des organisateurs bien identifiés, un système... Ils avaient pas mis de leur c'était une mise en scène sans metteur en scène. Et l'on découvre dans ces blocages des manifestants avec un nouveau visage. Après un petit moment de sympathie, de curiosité, a très vite épousé le regard du pouvoir. Un camion de gendarmerie attaqué ce matin sur les champs élysées Qui a creusé cet antagonisme entre les gilets jaunes et puis les journalistes qui essayaient de comprendre un phénomène mais qui souvent le caricaturaient et souvent même le diffamaient. Sur le fait de savoir si le mouvement des gilets jaunes avait libéré une parole antisémite. Mais c'est qu'on a peut-être un peu oublié d'où venait en fait le vrai pouvoir en France. Il vient du peuple. Et puis, force est de constater qu'on est, est quatre mois plus tard et que les manifestations se poursuivent. The Yellow Vest call it Act 23, the 23rd consecutive week of protests across France. The numbers on the streets were boosted in the aftermath of the Notre Dame fire and the billions of dollars that flooded in for reconstruction. The demonstrators who first took to the streets and roundabouts over the rising price of fuel before raising other economic issues are now targeting institutions they say are protecting the rich and powerful at the expense of the people. They reserve a special place on their placards for the police and their sometimes brutal response as well as for journalists, some of whom have been attacked by protesters. La colère. The protesters' anger towards the media is understandable, but it cannot justify violence or hatred of all media, because this ends up being a hatred of democracy. Democracy is about respecting the media, even when you don't like what the media says. Of course, there was a strong grievance when the Yellow Vest movement began, that the media was not reporting their side of the story, most notably with regard to police violence. Today, journalism is a profession that stands discredited by the Yellow Vests and wider French society. Here at France Info, we are lucky enough to have great proximity to the parts of France that accuse journalists of only covering Paris and the middle and upper classes and of forgetting those sections of society that feel disowned and invisible. When the protests began, we covered it like all the social movements that have come before it. Why are they angry? What is the response from politicians? The protesters clearly showed that as long as they weren't being heard, they wouldn't stop. Their main message was, nobody is listening to us, nobody ever has. We are the voices you've been deaf to for the past 10, 20, 30 years. And this completely changes the way we have to cover things. The 24-hour news channel Ansora Dubois reports for, BFM, is the most widely watched in France. It's also the journalistic bête noire of the Yellow Vest's movement. Among the complaints over BFM's treatment of their story are that it's been sensationalized, that protesters have been criminalized, and that instances of protester violence have been overstated. BFM TV, vraiment, c'est le summum de l'hypocrisie médiatique. Alors, euh, c'est vraiment aussi le summum, euh, je dirais, de cette... Euh, de ce pont qui existe entre les puissances politiques, les puissances financières et le traitement médiatique qui est fait. Pour nous, Gilets jaunes, on a compris une chose. Dans l'actuel combat contre l'oligarchie française, parce qu'on combat une oligarchie, c'est comme ça qu'on les nomme, euh, les médias sont importants, c'est la colonne vertébrale de ce système. BFM TV journalists have faced aggression from demonstrators. They were even attacked live on air once. And the Yellow Vests have also taken to protesting outside BFM TV's offices. 
However, the French media's credibility problems go beyond the Yellow Vest story, and they're quantifiable. This past January, one month into the protests, La Croix, a national Catholic newspaper, published a poll. When asked whether their journalists were independent, able to resist pressure brought by political parties, 69% of respondents said no. That's more than two-thirds of French news consumers. French journalists are just like American ones when Donald Trump came to power. They live in a bubble. They're oblivious to a whole section of French society, since they're essentially part of a small milieu that huddles in on itself. They only see and analyse this narrow sector of French public opinion, leaving the rest out. The hatred of the media is not something that's particularly unique to the Gilets jaunes. It's universal within French society. I want to be clear that journalists are doing their jobs. They don't need to be told how to do it. We aren't deaf to criticism. After all, we're a community riddled with self-doubt, always reassessing ourselves more than other professions. What has happened now is that the polemics on the media have reached a degree of intensity seldom seen before. So the Yellow Vests have turned to alternative forms of media. The demonstrations are routinely live-streamed by the Yellow Vests themselves, as well as by video publishers like Brut and Taranis News, who've racked up millions of views. It's an approach that's put them at odds with the police. Gaspard Glance, the founder of Taranis News, was arrested at last Saturday's protest, ostensibly for an obscene gesture at the police, and is banned from attending further protests until his hearing in October. Extrêmement puissant, je peux vous dire, et très toxique. On TV, RT France, a news channel bankrolled by the Russian government, has reportedly quadrupled its French audience through its coverage of the Yellow Vest protests. RT has been dedicated to this story, providing the kinds of comprehensive coverage its backers at the Kremlin would be unlikely to tolerate if the protests were happening in Moscow or St. Petersburg. Unfortunately, we've seen a lot of criticism on RT France even before the channel was launched. In fact, RT France is a French channel with French journalists and they do their job. Every Saturday we basically go into the streets and we have live transmissions and we give the floor to people who come over. And with the other media, even the headlines in the beginning of the movement were more like the Gilets Jaunes are either extreme right or extreme left. Now I think the situation is changing because the media is trying to catch up. But I think the moment was lost. That's why they turn into media like ours. Russia today, is a media of power. Russia today represents Russian state power, even if French journalists work there. Make no mistake, it's a channel controlled by the Russian government. So it certainly has its own ideological and political agenda. And that's their right. But it's our job as journalists to provide people with useful information not just feed them what they want to hear, echo their opinion. When it comes to social movements, few can match the impact of France's yellow vests. Just weeks after the protests began, President Macron pledged to increase the minimum wage. This week he went further, a raft of concessions including 5 billion euros in tax cuts. En réduisant significativement l'impôt sur le revenu. They were the result of his Grand Débat, a national policy debate and a direct response to the Yellow Vests. The other debate the protesters have provoked is about the media establishment. Questions about media ownership, how journalists cover protests, why the levels of trust in French media are so low, questions that because of the yellow vests, are more visible now than ever before, whether on the streets Les médias sont trop financés par des pouvoirs de l'argent or in the studios. Pourquoi certains gilets jaunes haïssent-ils les médias Finally, we have Noam Chomsky, media theorist, political scientist, as you have never seen him before. We produced a special episode last year on the 40th anniversary of the publication of his book, Manufacturing Consent, which changed the way a lot of people see the news media. But we've never seen an animated version of Chomsky in a rap song. This one, called Soundtrack to the Struggle 2, was put together by the British-Iraqi rapper Loki and his collaborators Sandhill and Guy Buss. 
It features Chomsky on one of the most underreported news stories out there, capitalist institutions and their indifference to the future of the planet. We'll leave you now with an excerpt, and we'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. Maximizing short-term profit and power uh, without regard to uh, what might happen to uh, the world in another 20 or 30 years. But that's called capitalism. But we can't survive that. that, that, that. Is it the economic system via the ecosystem? How we gonna define deep when the seas have risen? How can we define woke when our sleep's commission drowned out by cold brother bots? How can the people listen? Can't detoxify as we watch the sky fade to grey? The source devoured corporate power killed the nation state sophisticated murder. Defined as innovation, corporations whine and dying just to mine the information. Amen versus humanity, terrorists who? His search engine knows your thought pattern better than you. In an environment resentful, uprising is essential. The Rising is torrential, think your silence will protect you Subject to propaganda that terrifies the slumbered We can jeopardise their cover if we energise the numbers Collectivise or die, protect your mind or suffer Life is paradise to some and a paradise to others